And with that, I'm going to introduce our special guest speaker tonight because it's a pleasure to have with us Dr. Terry Mortensen. Now, Terry is going to be speaking, as you can see on the screen, on the subject of millions of years, the idea's unscientific origin and catastrophic consequences. If you haven't heard this talk before, it is an amazing talk. It'll open um, your eyes to why this issue is important, but where these ideas came from and how they've infiltrated um, the church. But let me quickly um, introduce Terry. Terry has um, uh, an MDiv from Trinity Evangelical School um, there in the States, and he has a PhD in the history of geology from Coventry University here in the UK. So that's not actually too far um, from us. And Terry, as well as serving for Answers in Genesis, he served previously for Campus Crusade for Christ for 26 years, mainly serving in Eastern Europe. So Terry, um, welcome this evening. Well, thank you. It's, uh, it's great to be with you. And having lived in the UK for 10 years, uh, it's, it's great to be back there, sort of, uh, through the internet. Uh, yeah. Go ahead. No, yeah, it's good to, good to have you with us. So I don't want to waste people's time. I just will hand over to you. You can give any introductions you want to give and then, you know, bless us with this amazing talk. Okay, okay. Well, it's, uh, it's a joy to be able to talk to you tonight about this subject of millions of years. I've had the privilege of speaking on this subject uh, and the whole creation evolution issue in uh, almost 30 countries now. And uh, I found that everywhere I go, uh, most Christians think it's no big deal. You can accept the millions of years. It doesn't really matter. And they don't have any idea where the idea came from. In fact, most of our evangelical theologians today uh, think that the age of the earth doesn't matter. So I hope that you will... Uh, Stay with me here for the next hour or, or a little bit more, maybe, and uh, look at this very important question. Now, if you, uh, if you go to a, a textbook on geology or, or maybe a museum uh, and other places, you'll often see a display like this that um, shows the, uh, the history of life according to what secular geologists say that life evolved from very simple bottom-dwelling sea creatures, which themselves had evolved from uh, microscopic uh, bacteria. And they say that from the first living cell up to the present is uh, about three and a half billion years. That's just an incomprehensible amount of time. Uh, that's not what people have always thought. That's really, really a relatively new idea. The idea of millions of years uh, developed in the early 19th century, and then it, it gradually expanded until we got to the billions for the age of the earth uh, by about 1940. So where did that idea come from? And uh, to answer that question, we need to first consider two very important passages of scripture that are relevant to this question. The first one is in uh, 2 Corinthians chapter 10. And it says, for the weapons of our warfare are not of the flesh, but divinely powerful for the destruction of fortresses. We are destroying speculations and every lofty thing raised up against the knowledge of God. And we are taking every thought captive to the obedience of Christ. So the Apostle Paul says to the Christians in the first century, we're involved in a war. It's not a war of arrows and spears and, and catapults. It's a war of ideas. He calls them speculations. Uh, the King James translates the same Greek word, imaginations. And he says these are high and lofty ideas that are raised up against the knowledge of God, and therefore they're raised up against God's word. And he says we as Christians need to pull down those speculations and we need to take every thought captive to the obedience of Christ. In uh, Colossians chapter 2, Paul says this. See to it that no one takes you captive through philosophy and empty deception, according to the tradition of men, according to the elementary principles of the world, rather than according to Christ. Paul says, be careful 
There are ideas out there. They're called the philosophies and traditions of men, and they're deceptive. They're the elementary principles of the world. They're the, the starting assumptions, the worldview assumptions of the world, and they are contrary to Christ. Now, this isn't the only verse in the Bible that warns Christians about deception. There are many verses, and uh, you can be, I can be deceived. If you find somebody who says, well, I can't be deceived, they're deceived already, because any of us can be deceived. If we're only given certain information about a particular uh, topic and we're not allowed to hear other contrary views, we can be deceived. And Paul says um, we can be deceived and we need to guard against it by building our thinking according to Christ, which means to build it according to the word of God. So what I want to show you, hopefully convince you of, is that over the last 200 years, most of the church has been taken captive by empty philosophy and the traditions of men and speculations and imaginations raised up against the knowledge of God. Well, to understand this issue of the age of the earth and creation and evolution, we need to understand that there are two broad categories of science. I like to call them operation science and origin science. Operation science is what we normally think of when we think of science. It's what people do wearing white lab coats, and they use the so-called scientific method, which I would define this way. The use of observable, repeatable experiments in a controlled environment it's usually in a laboratory, to understand how things operate or function in the present physical universe in order to find cures for disease, produce new technology, or put a man on the moon. So it's the use of observable experiments, repeatable experiments, to find out how things operate or function in the present so that we can manipulate them for our good. So. Uh, operation science is also called experimental science or origin science. And most of biology, chemistry, physics, engineering research, medical research, those are all forms of operation observable experimental science. They're looking at things in the present to see if they can uh, control or manipulate those things to cure disease or otherwise improve our lives. But that kind of science won't answer the question, how did the Grand Canyon form? You can't recreate the Grand Canyon in the laboratory. It's there, those rock layers are there, that huge erosional uh, feature is there, but you wanna know what happened in the unobservable, unrepeatable past to produce what you're looking at in the present. That's a historical question. Operation, experimental, observational science won't answer the question, how did those creatures come into existence? Now, the question is not, how do you get a dog from a previous dog? That's observational science. We can watch mommy dog and daddy dog get together and then mommy dog gets bigger and a few weeks later, baby dogs come out of mommy dog. And we can repeat that experiment or that observation over and over. But the question we, we have is how did the first dog come into existence? How did the first elephant, the first horse come into existence? You can't recreate that in the laboratory. That's a historical event in the unobservable, unrepeatable past. Operation science, origin science, uh, excuse me, operation science, experimental, observational science won't answer the question, how did Saturn come into existence? It's there. We can study it and see what it's doing in the present, but the question is, how did it come into existence in the unrepeatable, unobservable past? And so for that, those kinds of historical questions, we need origin science. And it uses what I call the legal historical method, which can be defined this way. The use of reliable eyewitness testimony, if any is available, and observable evidence to determine the past unobservable, unrepeatable event or events which produce the observable evidence we see in the present. So two sources of information to answer the historical question. Do we have any eyewitness testimony of somebody who was there 
who saw this happen in the past. And then we have the evidence in the present that we can study to look for clues to try to reconstruct the unobservable, unrepeatable past. And so origin science is also called historical science and historical geology, paleontology that studies fossils, archaeology, cosmology, the study of the origin of the, of the cosmos, and criminal investigation. They're all forms of historical or origin science. They are looking at things in the present and trying to reconstruct the past history. The question of operation science and origin science, the difference between them can be illustrated this way. A car mechanic is an operation scientist. He knows how the car operates. He knows how the pistons go up and down. He knows how the air conditioner works. And if it doesn't work, he knows how to fix it. But just because he knows how the car operates doesn't mean he knows anything about the car or its parts came into existence. The car manufacturer is the origin scientist. He knows how the car operates, but he also knows how all of its parts came into existence. And I submit to you that the way something operates doesn't tell you how it came into existence. The way the pistons go up and down don't tell you how the pistons came into existence. The way the air conditioner works doesn't tell you how the air conditioner came into existence. The question of origins is a categorically different question than the question of operation. And this whole debate about creation versus evolution, millions of years versus thousands of years, as the Bible says, those are ideas and models and stories in the area of origin science. So it's not a battle of science versus religion. It's a battle of, as we will see, different worldviews that are being used to reconstruct the unobserved past. Again, just to make this clear, we can look at animals, we can see how they operate and how they function. That's operation science. But the question is, how did the first ones originate? We can look at the Grand Canyon, we can look at the Colorado River, and we can see that the Colorado River carries sediments, and we can see their erosional features. But the question is, how did the Colorado River come into existence? How did the Grand Canyon come into existence? How did all those erosional features happen? And was the river there first before the canyon or was the canyon there before the river? These are questions of history and we are dealing with the unobservable, unrepeatable past. Most evolutionists today and an awful lot of Christians, especially those who accept the millions of years either ignore this difference or deny that there is any significant difference between operation science and origin science. But a few do recognize it. Ernst Mayer, one of the greatest evolutionists of the 20th century in America, professor of Har at Harvard University uh, in zoology, and an atheist until his death at the age of 100 said, uh, Evolution is a historical process that cannot be proven by the same arguments and methods by which purely physical or functional phenomena can be documented. And I could give you quotes of, of some other evolutionists who see that the question of function is different than the question of history and origins. For the first 1800 years, the almost universal belief in the church was that God created in six literal days, a little over 6,000 years ago, and destroyed the world with a global year-long catastrophic flood. There are some odd individuals who question that. Augustine was confused about the days of Genesis, but he didn't believe in millions of years. He believed that everything was in an instant, but he did believe that the earth was only about 6,000 years old, and he did believe in a global catastrophic flood. But about 200 years ago, the idea of millions of years began to develop. And so I want to look at how that idea developed and who some of the key people were and what they were thinking. It wasn't just one person that uh, developed this idea. 
But between about 1770 and 1830, a number of views of Earth history developed. One of the men who was very influential in this thinking was James Hutton. He was, uh, he, he was up in uh, Scotland and uh, he studied medicine at the university, but after he finished his studies, he took over the family farm, but his real love was geology. And in uh, 1788, he wrote a journal article. And then in 1795, he published a, a long book arguing that the geological uh, features of the earth were the result of untold ages of erosion and sedimentation. He could see evidence of wind and water erosion on the land that would carry particles to the uh, creeks, which would carry it to the rivers, which would carry those sediments to the ocean and dump those sediments on the ocean floor. And then he could see evidence of volcanic activity in Scotland. And so he imagined that the internal heat of the earth would um, harden those sediments on the ocean floor. And then from time to time, through some convulsion, raise some of those sediments above sea level to become new land masses. And so he said, the continents are slowly being eroded into the ocean. The ocean floor is being lifted up to become new continents which will eventually be eroded into the oceans, which will eventually be lifted up to become new continents. He said, I can see no evidence of a beginning in the rock record. Now he didn't see a single continent erode into the ocean. He didn't see a single continent come out of the ocean. He was speculating or imagining about the unobserved past to explain what he saw in the present. Then there was George Cuvier. He was a comparative anatomist and paleontologist. And as he studied the fossils that were found in and around Paris, he developed his theory of the earth. And he speculated that the fossils in the various rock layers were the result of a series of catastrophic floods of a continental or global scale, each one separated by long periods of time. And in those catastrophes, many creatures died, they got buried in sediments and became fossils. And then God either created new creatures after each catastrophe to replace the creatures that had perished, or survivors repopulated the earth. Now, he never saw a single one of those floods happen and produce a single one of those sedimentary layers with fossils. He was speculating or imagining about the unobserved past. And then there was Charles Lyell. Lyell was uh, trained in law at Oxford University. He was born the year that Hutton died, and he built on Hutton's ideas. And he was independently wealthy, so he had the time and the money to go out uh, walking around looking at rocks and fossils. And in 1830, he published the first of his three volumes of Principles of Geology. Building on Hutton, he argued, there have never been any catastrophic floods of a continental or global scale. Oh, a little flood here, a little volcano there, uh, an earthquake here every so often. But the primary processes of geological change, he said, are slow and gradual. So three, uh, three views, three key men. And so by, in the early 19th century, we had three competing views of Earth history. We had the catastrophist view of Cuvier and others who did believe in God and believed in a supernatural beginning, SB. But then after God created those first forms of life, uh, life went along for a long period of time. And then there was one of those catastrophic floods of a continental or global scale, wiping out most or all of the creatures living at the time. Uh, survivors repopulated the earth or God created new creatures and life went along for a long period of time. And there was another catastrophic flood. And this happened many, many times over untold ages. He was clearly thinking millions of years. Then there was the view of Hutton and Lyle. And from their writings, we can't be sure if they believed in a supernatural beginning, but on their timeline, there were no seas, 
no catastrophic floods of a continental or global scale. Only catastrophic events on par with what we see in recent history. And that expanded Earth history even more because the geological record was primarily the result of slow, gradual erosion and deposition. Those were in contrast to the biblical traditional view, which was defended by a group of authors that I focused on in my PhD research, who collectively became known as the scriptural geologists. And they believed Genesis, so they believed in a supernatural creation week, SCW, of creation in six days, followed about 1600 years later by Noah's flood, which uh, these men believed was responsible for producing most of the geological record of rock layers and fossils. And then the earth recovered from that event up to the present. And this whole period uh, from the very beginning to the present was only about 6,000 years. Now, <clears throat> they opposed both the catastrophist and the uniformitarian view. But that was only one Christian response to these uh, old earth ideas. Many Christians quickly began to accept the old earth ideas, even while the catastrophists and the uniformitarians were arguing. And so they had to try to find a way to fit those millions of years into the Bible. One approach, this in regard to Genesis 1, was Thomas Chalmers. He was a Presbyterian minister and a naturalist up in Scotland. And in 1804, as a young pastor of 24 years old, he began to preach what became known as the uh, gap theory. He said, the Bible doesn't tell us how old the earth is. It tells us how old man is, about 6,000 years, but the geologists can have all the time they want. We'll just fit it between verse 1 and verse 2 of Genesis 1. That became a very popular view in the church. Then there was George Stanley Faber. He was a, a, a respected Anglican theologian. And in 1823, he published a book in which he argued for what became known as the day-age theory. If we just take those days as figurative, symbolic of long periods of time, we can harmonize the Bible with what the geologists are saying. That wasn't as popular, as far as I can tell, until about the middle of the 19th century, because Anyone who was reading the, the geological literature could see that the order in which fossils appeared in the geological record, according to the evolutionists, uh, according to the old earth geologists, didn't match the order in which creatures were created, according to Genesis. So the gap theory seemed to be more popular. Well, those are reinterpretations of Genesis 1, but if you're, gonna, if you're going to fit millions of years into the Bible, You've got to do something with Noah's flood. And so there were various approaches. One was John Fleming, a Presbyterian minister. And in 1826, he published an artic article in which he argued that Noah's flood was a global peaceful flood. It was so peaceful, it left no geological evidence. And the proof, he said, was right there in the, geolo in the biblical account. Noah sent out a dove. At the end of the flood, it came back with an olive leaf in its beak, and that's proof positive that the flood was so peaceful it didn't even damage the plants. Of course, he was a zoologist. I guess he didn't know that uh, olive plants are one of the hardiest plants known to man. They grow in almost any soil condition, and you can start an olive plant from the a bud, from a bark, from a branch, from a root. I don't know anybody that holds that view today because a global peaceful flood is equivalent to talking about square circles. There's no such thing as a flood that leaves no evidence. So a more popular view was that of John Pye Smith, a congregational theologian. And in 1838, he published a book in which he argued that Noah's flood was a local flood in the Mesopotamian Valley of the Tigris and Euphrates rivers modern day Iraq, and it's just described in exaggerated language in the Bible. Now, all of those men I just mentioned uh, were considered and would consider themselves, and I would consider them conservative Christians. They would have all affirmed that the Bible is the inspired word of God. But there was one other approach, 
and that was uh, the liberal theologians. Liberal theology had been developing on the European continent from the middle of the 18th century, and it had been largely kept out of Britain and North America because of the influence of the great evangelical awakenings under the Wesleys and uh, Whitfield in the UK and uh, Whitfield and Jonathan Edwards and others in the United States. But liberal theology began to seep into the churches in Britain and America uh, in the 1810s and 1820s. And the liberal theologians said, you other people are all wrong because you're treating Genesis 1 to 11 as history. It's not history, it's mythology. Just like the ancient Egyptians and Assyrians and the Babylonians, they had ancient flood myths and creation myths, so did the ancient Jews. These are pre-scientific, primitive, superstitious ideas. So in the early 19th century, we had these various compromises with old earth geology. We had the gap theory that put all the millions of years between the first two verses of Genesis 1. The day age view that said each day represented long ages. Noah's flood was a global peaceful flood. And Noah's flood was a local flood in Genesis's myth. And in the midst of all of that were those men that I focused on in my PhD research, the scriptural geologists, who we would call today young earth creationists. And I found about 30 authors writing between about 1820 and 1850 in, in Britain. And they were raising biblical, philosophical, and geological arguments against these old earth views. Well, if you want to learn more about them, you can get my book, The Great Turning Point, which is a shortened version of my PhD thesis. But in that book and in that thesis, uh, I argued that contrary to what most historians of geology today say, this controversy in the early 19th century was not, as they call it, the Genesis geology debate. It was not a conflict between the geologists who knew the rocks and Bible-thumping fundamentalists who didn't know anything about geology. Rather, what I argued was that the real nature of this debate was philosophical and religious. It was a worldview conflict. It was a conflict between the religious and philosophical worldview of one group of scientists and non-scientists against the religious and philosophical worldview of another group of scientists and non-scientists who were studying the very same rocks and fossils. And we don't have to get complicated here, but we do need to understand this worldview conflict. Maybe you have heard of deism. Deism was a religion that uh, developed in the late 17th and early 18th century. Uh, deists believed in God, but they believed that God was distant and in the past. He created the world at the beginning uh, he built into it the laws of nature, and then he let it develop and run according to those laws. So kind of like a watchmaker who makes a watch, and then he lets it run the way he designed it. So in a deist view, um, God is distant. He's in the past. He's not active in his creation. There are no miracles. There's no answer to prayer. There's no uh, prophecy. There's no incarnation of Jesus Christ, there's no resurrection, and there's no atoning sacrifice for sin. It was a religion of good works based on study of nature. Another view that developed at this time was uh, atheism. Now, there have been atheists in the past, but in the history of humanity, uh, the vast majority of people have believed in some kind of God or gods, but atheism really began to take hold in, uh, in Europe, particularly in France, where it led to the bloody French Revolution. And of course, the atheist says, there is no God. The universe is all there is. Contrast that with what the Bible says. Like deism, biblical Christianity says that God is distinct from his creation. If the creation disappeared, God would still exist. He is the creator. But the Bible teaches one other very important thing about God uh, related to our topic, and that is that God is, as theologians say, imminent. 
He is present everywhere in his creation, upholding his creation by the power of his word. And from time to time, he works in his creation in an unusual way, which the Bible calls an, a miracle or theologians also call acts of divine providence. So three different worldviews. And those worldviews will affect what a scientist sees and how he interprets what he sees as he looks at the earth and tries to reconstruct the past history of the world. Now, historians of science have a pretty good idea what the theology was of those men who helped to develop that old earth idea, either by studying their published writings or their private journals and letters, which uh, many of them left quite a few copies of. James Hutton was a deist or an atheist. Historians aren't sure. Cuvier was a deist or a vague theist. He certainly believed in God, but he wasn't a Bible-believing Christian. And Lyle was a deist or a Unitarian, which for this topic doesn't make any difference. So I want you to notice something very, very important. These men were not unbiased, objective pursuers of truth. There is no such person. There never has been. Every scientist has a worldview. Every scientist either believes in God or he doesn't believe in God. Believes that God is active in the world or not active in the world. Believes the Bible is the word of God or doesn't believe that. Every scientist has a worldview, and that worldview affects what they see and how they interpret what they see as they try to reconstruct the unobserved past. Some of these men made their ideas very clear through what they wrote. James Hutton said this, the past history of our globe must be explained. Okay, so now he's laying down a, a law of geological reasoning. It must be explained, he says, by what can be seen to be happening now. No powers are to be employed that are not natural to the globe. No action to be admitted except those of which we know the principle. Now, what has he just ruled out with that law of geological reasoning? He's ruled out creation. Creation wasn't happening when he wrote that sentence. And creation wasn't natural. It was supernatural. What else has he ruled out by this statement? By insisting that everything must be explained by present natural processes. He's ruled out Noah's flood. Noah's, Noah's flood wasn't happening when he wrote that sentence. And Noah's flood was not natural. Well, it was natural in the sense that water flowed downhill in Noah's flood, just like moving water does today. And those moving waters eroded and carried sediments and deposited those sediments, just like moving water does today. But the flood wasn't simply a fluke of nature. It wasn't simply a, an accidental hiccup in the course of nature. It was a divine judgment against a sinful world. So he's ruled out creation and the flood before he ever looked at the evidence. In another place, he said, but surely general deluges form no part of the theory of the earth. Why? Why, Mr. Hutton? Why can't we have a general deluge, which is an old way of saying global flood? Why can't we have a global flood in our earth history? He tells us. For or because the purpose of this earth is evidently to maintain vegetable and animal life and not to destroy them. Now you see the logic? <clears throat> he says, look, look at our earth. It's obviously designed to support plant and animal life. We can't allow a global flood in our past because that would destroy all the plant and animal life. What's he doing? He's reasoning that the present is the key to the past. Fundamental error. And that principle didn't come from the rocks and the fossils. It came from his anti-biblical worldview. The present is not the key to the past. The 100, 
percent infallible account of the all-knowing eyewitness creator is the key to the past and the present. Biblical revelation is the key to the past, to understanding the past and to understanding the present. So we can look at those three views of earth history. And the catastrophists and the uniformitarians did have a different view, but they were reasoning the same way. They were reasoning that the present is the key to the past. The uniformitarians were reasoning the present slow gradual processes are the key to explaining the past. The catastrophists were saying, no, the present catastrophic processes are the key to the past. But they both ignored the Bible. The scriptural geologist said, revelation is the key to the past and the present. Well, <clears throat> Charles Lyell said this, I've always been strongly impressed with the weight of an observation of an excellent writer and skillful geologist who said that for the sake of revelation, he's referring to the Bible, as well as of science, of truth in every form, the physical part of geological inquiry ought to be conducted as if the scriptures were not in existence. Well, I wouldn't have any problem with that if there were nothing, if there was nothing in the Bible describing any geologically significant global events. But there are two. The third day of creation, when God ca caused dry land to appear, evidently part of the crust of the earth came up out of the water that covered the whole earth the first two days to become the dry land. And that would have been a huge erosion and sedimentation event. But if we looked at those sediments later, we wouldn't find any fossils in them because God hadn't created the plants, animals, or people yet. The second key event is Noah's flood, which was designed to destroy all the land animals, birds, and people not in the ark. And by implication, would have ripped up all the vegetation on the land and buried lots of creatures in sediments. So when he says we ought to do geology as if the scriptures are not in existence, <coughs> that is a very anti-biblical perspective. In fact, writing in a private letter to one of his friends, he said that he wanted to free the science of geology from Moses. Now, isn't that an interesting statement? What does he have against Moses? He wants to silence God's eyewitness testimony. Remember in origin science, the two possible sources of information, eyewitness testimony and the observable evidence in the present. He wants to silence God's eyewitness testimony. So <clears throat> what Lyle and Hutton and others like them were advocating was a worldview with three basic assumptions. I like to call them uniformitarian naturalism, a big label for three very simple ideas. The first is that nature is all that exists. Now, not every geologist then or every scientist now believes that, but most scientists do their scientific work as if that's true. So they might believe in God on Sunday or Saturday or whenever they go to their religious services. But when they do their science, they do it as if nature is all that exists. The second assumption that took control of geology, everything can and indeed must be explained by time plus chance plus the laws of nature working on matter. If you have those three things, time, enough of it, millions and billions of years, chance, and the laws of nature, the laws of physics and chemistry, the laws of genetics. If you have those three things, you can explain the origin of rock layers and fossils. You can explain the origin of living creatures. You can explain the origin of stars and galaxies and planets and the earth itself. You just need enough time, chance, and the laws of nature. And the third assumption that took control of geology in the early 19th century is that the processes of geological change have always been operating in the past at the same rate, frequency, and power 
as we observe today. Oh, an occasional catastrophic event like we see today, but primary processes of change have been slow and gradual. And the earthquakes and the volcanoes and the tsunamis haven't really been any bigger on average per year and more frequent than we observe today. Three powerful assumptions that took control of science. None of those points can be derived from looking at rocks and fossils. They are philosophical and religious in nature. So in the early 19th century, we had these three competing views of Earth history. Well, by about 1840, those first two views passed off the scene and the uniformitarian view became the ruling view in geology. 1840 is also about the time when geology became a degree at the university. Prior to that, you could take a series of lectures, but you couldn't get a degree. And 1840 is also about the time that geology became a paid profession. Prior to that, geologists were independently wealthy uh, and uh, <clears throat> did the study of geology as a hobby. So from 1840 on, everybody who went to the university to study geology, every geological society, every geological journal was controlled by this uniformitarian way of thinking. Slow, gradual processes will explain everything you see. And Charles Darwin was influenced by those ideas. He went on his famous five-year voyage around the world in 1831, and he took on the HMS Beagle with him, the first volume of Charles Lyell's book, Principles of Geology, and he absorbed Lyell's thinking. And he said, I always feel as if my books came half out of Lyell's brains, and that I never acknowledged this sufficiently, nor do I know how I can, without saying so in so many words. For I've always thought that the great merit of the principles of geology was that it altered the whole tone of one's mind and therefore that when seeing a thing never seen by Lyle, one yet saw it partially through his eyes. So Darwin was just taking the principles of uniformitarian naturalism that developed in geology and applied them to biology. Slow, gradual processes will explain everything you see in the rocks and fossils. Slow, gradual processes will explain everything you see in living things. A lot of Christians today are concerned about Charles Darwin's theory. They reject the idea that we evolve from ape-like creatures. They reject the idea that all plants and animals are descended from a common ancestor and that Dinosaurs evolved into birds and fish walked out on the land and became amphibians. They see the great complexity of life and they have lots of good scientific reasons for rejecting that. But most Christians today have accepted the millions of years and they don't realize that the problem is not Darwin. The problem is Lyle and Hutton. The problem is the worldview assumptions that took control of science through Hutton and Lyle that were then adopted by Darwin and then adopted in all the other sciences. So what we need to understand is that no scientist goes out and looks at the world with an empty mind, or we could say no scientist goes out and looks at the world without a pair of glasses on, philosophical glasses. We call them evolutionary glasses or biblical glasses. And most scientists in the world, including most Christian scientists, are wearing evolutionary glasses. They have, um, they have adopted the principles of thinking, the assumptions of Lyle and Hutton and Darwin. But Christians shouldn't be wearing those evolutionized glasses. They should be wearing biblical glasses. They should be taking the eyewitness testimony of the creator. His truth should guide their thinking about the world as they study the world to understand uh, the history of the rocks and the fossils, or the history of life. Well, let me illustrate with a series of pictures what I've been talking about. 
on the left here, you have the, uh, the old earth geologist. And he had a certain set of assumptions, those naturalistic assumptions that I just defined for you. But biblical Christians don't accept those assumptions. They have a biblical worldview. They believe God's eyewitness testimony. They believe what God says about creation in six days, uh, about 6,000 years ago, and what he says about a global flood at the time of Noah that destroyed the earth. But here's what happened in the 19th century. The geologist said, both some Christian and secular, listen, if you want to help us understand the rocks of the earth and the history of the earth, you need to lay down your Bible because you're biased. You need to come over to this neutral territory. And so a lot of Christians laid down their Bibles and they went over to what they thought was neutral ground. But those old earth geologists, they never laid down their assumptions. They never got in that neutral ground. And once the Christians were in what they thought was neutral ground, the battle was over because there really is no neutral ground. Everybody has a worldview. Now, in operation science, worldview assumptions don't have much influence because operation science is constrained by the principle of repeatable observable experiments. But in origin science, worldview is critical because what you believe about God and his word will affect what you see and how you interpret what you see as you try to reconstruct the unobserved past and the origin of things. So we need to understand a fundamental point, and that is that all the geologists in the early 19th century and today all have the same rocks and fossils to study. They have the same Grand Canyon, the same white cliffs of Dover to study. They don't have different ones, but if they start with naturalistic assumptions, they're going to come up with the idea of an old earth and no global flood. But if they start with biblical assumptions and look at the very same evidence, the very same rocks and fossils, they see all kinds of evidence that confirms a young earth and a global flood. Well, <clears throat> as far as I can tell, by about 1840, uh, 1850, virtually the whole church had accepted the millions of years. And they didn't realize that the battle is not at the level of the rocks and the fossils. The battle is at the level of the assumptions that are used to interpret the evidence. It's a battle of worldviews. Well, what happened after that? As I said, from a, by about 1850, virtually the whole church had accepted the millions of years. Now I wanna show you what happened. And I'm gonna mention some people uh, and before I do, I want to draw your attention to another passage of Scripture. In 1 Timothy chapter 6, Paul says, O Timothy, guard what was entrusted to you, avoiding worldly and empty chatter and the opposing arguments of what is falsely called knowledge, which some have professed and thus gone astray from the faith. Paul said, be careful. There are ideas out there that sound like truth, that sound like knowledge, that are not really true. They're falsely so-called. And if you're not careful, Paul says to Timothy, you or the people in your church will go astray. One translation says, they will be shipwrecked regarding the faith. I'm going to show you some people who personally did not go astray, but their compromise, their acceptance of the millions of years has led many others astray. One of those was Charles Haddon Spurgeon, the great Baptist preacher in London. He said in a sermon in 1855 at the age of 21, can anyone tell me when the beginning was? Years ago, we thought the beginning of this world was when Adam came upon it. Yes, that is what the church believed for the first 1800 years and what faithful Jews believed for 1400 years before that. But Spurgeon went on, we have discovered 
that thousands of years before that, God was preparing chaotic matter to make it a fit abode for man, putting races of creatures upon it who might die and leave behind the marks of his handiwork and marvelous skill before he tried his hand on man. In another sermon that same year, he talked about millions of years. <clears throat> and in another sermon about 20 years later, he talked about millions of years and geology. He evidently believed in the gap theory, although he wrote very little on this topic in his whole pastoral career. He didn't understand where the millions of years idea came from. Then there was C.I. Schofield, a great American Bible scholar. In 1909, he published his reference Bible. Millions of copies went out into the English-speaking world. Uh, it was translated into some other languages. And in the marginal note of Genesis 1, verse 2, he had the gap theory with this statement. The first creative act refers to the dateless past and give scope for all the geological ages. That statement was in the Schofield referenced Bible through multiple editions until uh, 1967 when the editors modified it a little bit, but what they have still leaves the door open for millions of years. Schofield was a great Bible teacher, but he didn't understand where the millions of years came from. He didn't understand the assumptions embedded in geology to arrive at those ages. Then there was the sad story at Princeton Seminary, which has been duplicated at many other Christian uh, educational institutions. Charles Hodge was the lead theologian in the mid to late 19th century. He held to an old earth, but he was anti-evolution. He said the Bible doesn't say how old the earth is. He died and his son, A.A. A. Hodge became the lead theologian. He accepted the millions of years, but he was, he was toying with the idea of evolution that maybe, just maybe, God guided the process of evolution. He died and B.B. Warfield became the lead theologian. He was even warmer to the idea of evolution as long as God was guiding it. He wrote quite a bit on this subject. He was an ardent evolutionist until his conversion to, to, to faith in Christ in his late teens. But in all of his writings, he never carefully dealt with the biblical text. And uh, he died in 1921. Princeton Seminary went downhill very rapidly into liberal theology after that. And there are a number of reasons for that. Um, but I think one of them was this compromise with evolutionary old earth thinking. Well, then there was Charles Templeton. He was a great evangelist. A, a contemporary of Billy Graham. He preached to thousands in the United States and in Great Britain and led many thousands to Christ. But he had questions about evolution. He didn't know what to do with it. And so he decided to go to seminary to get answers. He went to Princeton Seminary in the late 1940s. He didn't get answers. He got professors teaching him that Genesis 1 to 11 is mythology. He came out of seminary, preached for a few more years, left the ministry, went into journalism, died in 2001 as an atheist. And the last book he wrote was entitled, Farewell to God, My Reasons for Rejecting the Christian Faith. And at the end of that book, he said this, I believe that there is no supreme being with human attributes, no God in the biblical sense, but that the life is the result of timeless evolutionary forces having reached its present transient state over millions of years. You see, ideas have consequences. Charles Hodge was old earth, but anti-evolution. His son was old earth and maybe, maybe evolution, as long as God is guiding the process. P.B. Warfield was even warmer to evolution, as long as God is guiding it. And after they died, and I believe they went to heaven, Charles Templeton went to their seminary and became an apostate. Ideas have consequences. And sometimes it takes decades before we see the fruit of false ideas. Davis Young is <clears throat> Professor Emeritus of Geology at Calvin College in the state of Michigan in America. He is the son of the great Old Testament scholar E.J. Young. 
he more than anyone else has influenced modern evangelical theologians to accept the millions of years. I know that from reading their theological works and they cite his work. In one of his books, he said this, the Christian who believes that the idea of an ancient earth is unbiblical would do better to deny the validity of any kind of historical geology and insist that the rocks must be the product of pure miracle rather than try to explain them in terms of the Noahic flood. An examination of the earth apart from ideological presuppositions is bound to lead to the conclusion that it is ancient. I hope you see now that, that the notion that you can study the earth apart from ideological presuppositions is absolutely false. That cannot be farther from the truth. There is no geologist, including Davis Young, who studies the rocks and fossils apart from ideological presuppositions. He absorbed the uniformitarian worldview when he studied geology, and he's been teaching it subtly to Christians ever since. So the issue is not what are the rocks and the fossils, the issue is what are the assumptions that we're using to interpret what glasses are we wearing? Well, as I said, Davis Young has influenced a lot of evangelical theologians. One of the men he has influenced is C. John Collins, one of the great uh, Old Testament scholars in America, professor of Old Testament at Covenant Seminary in St. Louis, and editor of the uh, notes in the ESV study Bible in the Old Testament. In his book, Science and Faith, where he argues for something like the day age view, he says, I conclude then that I have no reason to disbelieve the standard theories of the geologists, including their estimate for the age of the earth. They may be wrong for all I know, but if they are wrong, it is not because they have improperly smuggled philosophical assumptions into their work. That is exactly what they have done. Well, the early geologists were smuggling philosophical assumptions into their work. And then they trained the next generations of geologists over the last 150 years to think with those philosophical assumptions. And they haven't realized that they've been smuggling them into their work. Nothing could be farther from the truth. My favorite professor in seminary, so, Dr. Collins is wearing evolutionized glasses when it comes to interpreting the early chapters of Genesis. My favorite professor in seminary was Wayne Grudem. I was, he was my advisor for three years. I was his teaching assistant for one year. Great Bible teacher. I learned a lot from him. But in his systematic theology, which has been translated into 12 major languages, and they're working on, I think, about six other languages. Um, he says this. Although our conclusions are tentative at this point in our understanding, scripture seems to be more easily understood to suggest, that's his italics, but not to require a young earth view while the observable facts of creation seem increasingly to favor an old earth view. No, Dr. Grudem, it is not the observable facts. It is the anti-biblical philosophical assumptions that have been used to interpret some of the observable facts. He doesn't understand where the millions of years idea came from. And I have tried ever since I was in seminary in the late uh, 1980s to get him to rethink that position. He doesn't understand that those geologists are all wearing evolutionized glasses, naturalistic uniformitarian assumptions controlling their interpretation of the geological evidence. So for the last 200 years, the scientists, the geologists have been saying, the rock layers show that the earth is millions of years old. You have to believe me, I'm a scientist. And most theologians and Bible scholars have said, well, we'll just have to accept the millions of years and add it to the Bible somehow. The gap theory, the day age view, and local flood idea, and many other views we could talk, out, talk about if we had time. 
I want to show you some people that have accepted those ideas. And I want to say at the very beginning here, I am not saying these men are heretics. I'm not saying they're horrible Christians. I'm not saying that they are heretics. I'm not saying that they didn't love their wives, that they didn't live exemplary lives. But I am saying, and I can document, that they were all compromised with the millions of years. They didn't understand where the evolutionary, the millions of years idea came from. We've already talked about Spurgeon, Hodge, Warfield, Schofield, J. Gretchen Machen, who left uh, Westminster, uh, well, left Princeton to start Westminster Seminary in Philadelphia. James Montgomery Boyce, one of the great Bible teachers in America. Gleason Archer, who taught Old Testament at my seminary, knew 26 ancient Near Eastern languages. Francis Schaeffer, a great apologist. I've benefited from many of his books. Billy Graham, God used him in a powerful way to lead many to Christ. J. Vernon, Vernon McGee, a, a Bible teacher on the radio. John Stodd, a famous British theologian. I've got a number of his books that have been very helpful. And then most of our great apologists in the United States, our most famous ones, William Lane Craig, J.P. Moreland, Paul Copan, Norman Geisler, who died recently, Hank Hanegraaff, Frank Turek, John Lennox in England, Greg Kukul. All of these men accept the millions of years. They don't think it matters. They're philosophers, but they don't understand the philosophical roots of the old earth view. And I've tried to interact with several of them and they're not even willing to engage in, this, in the discussion. Our three most influential um, schools in the United States in training the next generation of apologists, defenders of the faith, Biola, Southern Evangelical Seminary and Veritas International University, they're all uh, influencing the students to accept the idea of millions of years. We could talk about Robbie Zacharias, William Dembski, Lee Strobel, Ken Keithley, C. John Collins, w Millard Erickson, Wayne Grudem, Eric Metaxas, Sean McDowell, Tim Keller, well-known people in the United States and Britain, John Piper, Os Guinness, Walter Kaiser, Bruce, Bruce Waltke, D.A. Carson, J.I. Packer, Stephen Meyer, Michael Horton, R.C. Sproul, Andy Stanley, and I can go on and on. All of these men, they're not horrible men. They're good men. They've done a lot of good for the church but they haven't understood where the millions of years idea comes from. And they have led the church to think, you can accept the millions of years, the age of the earth doesn't matter, we can just agree to disagree, it's a side issue, it's not important. But I need to remind you, if you're a Christian, that we shouldn't have any evangelical popes in our lives. And we don't have an evangelical cardinal college of cardinals determining for us what is true. The Bible must be our supreme authority. Truth is not determined by majority vote, not majority vote in science, and not majority vote in the 20th and 21st century in the church. We must test everything against the word of God. A lot of Christians I found <clears throat> in my travels here and in other countries say, well, <clears throat> we don't believe in evolution. What they mean is they don't believe in biological evolution, but they accept the millions of years and they don't realize that evolution is really a three-part theory to explain all of reality. So we have biological evolution to explain the origin of life and the origin of man, and then geological evolution to explain the origin of the rock layers and fossils and the earth itself, and then cosmological evolution to explain the origin of stars and galaxies and solar systems. It's all evolution. And I could give you quotes from leading evolutionists who say that it's all evolution. It's all driven by the same naturalistic uniformitarian assumptions. It's based on the assumptions of naturalism, which is another name for atheism. So even if we don't accept biological and human evolution, if we still accept cosmological and geological evolution, we're still accepting that naturalistic worldview. All of that is still based on naturalism. Well, 
as we wrap up, let me give you a series of pictures to illustrate what I've been saying and hopefully give you a little mental relief. Back in the uh, 18th and 19th century, the church was saying, come to Jesus, come to the cross and be saved. And the enemies of the gospel announced an attack, launched an attack against that gospel. It was the idea of millions of years. It wasn't aimed at the cross. It was aimed at the foundation of the cross, at the idea of millions of years. It was aimed at the book of Genesis. And most of the church said, yeah, but it, it didn't hit the cross. Don't worry about the age of the earth. That's not important. The Bible's not about geology. It's about salvation. Now, if the enemies of the cross had aimed at, at the cross, alarm bells would have gone off in the church. And, and they would have risen up in defense. But the enemies were smart. They aimed at the foundation of the cross. And most of the church said it's just a side issue. But what does Psalm 11.3 say? If the foundations are destroyed, what can the righteous do? And so over the last 200 years, there's just been a relentless bombardment of the foundations of the Christian faith found in the book of Genesis. The dating methods, uh, uh, radiometric dating methods came in the early 20th century, Darwin's theory of evolution and the Big Bang theory in the 20th century, hammering away at Genesis. It is the most attacked part of the Bible over the last 200 years. And it has caused incredible damage. And I could give you quotes by evolutionists who see this as a direct hit. Undermine Genesis and you destroy the gospel, they say. But most of the church says it didn't hit the cross. The age of the earth doesn't matter. And Christians have continued to invent new ways of interpreting Genesis to try to fit millions of years into the Bible. What happened in the Garden of Eden when the serpent came to Eve and he said, has God said? He asked a question. He got her doubting and confused about what God said. And once he got her doubting God's word, then he went for the kill. He said, you won't die. God's lying to you. Go ahead and eat that fruit. So first he got her to doubt God's word, and then he got her to deny God's word. And that worked so well that I have observed Satan has been using that strategy ever since. Get Christians to doubt God's word and then deny God's word. And I've observed that Satan is not picky. He's not choosy. He's actually excited to use Christians to get other Christians to doubt and deny God's word. And Paul warned in 2 Corinthians 11, but as I, I'm afraid that as the serpent deceived Eve by his craftiness, your minds will be led astray from the simplicity and purity of devotion to Christ. And so what have we seen in Western Europe, Great Britain, and North America over the last 200 years? Growing unbelief. They are the most pagan, the, the most anti-Christian cultures in the world now. They are the hardest place to lead somebody to Christ. It is easier to lead a Muslim to Christ today in a Muslim country than it is to lead a Western European or an American to Christ. The church's compromise with millions of years has not caused people to become more open to the gospel, but less open. So we've seen this 200-year slippery slide. First, Christians rejected the biblical chronology and, and the global flood. And then they rejected the supernatural creation of plants and animals. And then they rejected the supernatural creation of Adam. And then they rejected the historicity of Adam. And then now in the 20th century, they're rejecting biblical morality, accepting divorce, the LGD, LGBTQ revolution, abortion, and rejecting the gospel. And so evangelicals are always just a few decades behind the liberals. <clears throat> well, I want to end here <clears throat> just before I look at some resources that might help you. <clears throat> Excuse me. I want to read to you a statement written by an Anglican pastor in 1834. 
He wrote a book, Popular Geology, Subversive of Divine Revelation. I read the book carefully. He didn't know anything about geology. His writings show he didn't know anything about geology, but he did believe his Bible, and he was a discerning reader of geological books. And I want you to listen to what he had to say in 1834. Now, this is, this is 19th century English, but I think you'll understand it. He said, many reverend geologists, that's because some of the early geologists were also ordained clergymen. Many reverend geologists, however, would evince their reverence for the divine revelation by making a distinction between its historical and its moral portions and maintaining that the latter only is inspired and absolute truth, but that the former is not so and therefore is open to any latitude of philosophic and scientific interpretation or even to a total denial. According to these impious and infidel modifiers and separators, there is not one third of the word of God that is inspired for not more, nor perhaps so much of that word is occupied in abstract moral revelation, instruction and precept. The other two thirds therefore are open to any scientific modification and interpretation or if scientifically required to a total denial. It may however be safely asserted that whoever professedly before men disbelieves the inspiration of any part of revelation, disbelieves in the sight of God, its inspiration altogether. If such principles were permitted of the most high to proceed to their ultimate drifts and tendencies, How long before they will be sweeping all faith in revealed and inspired veracity from off the face of the earth? What the consequences of such things must be to a revelation possessing land, time will rapidly and awfully unfold in its opening pages of national skepticism, infidelity, and apostasy, and of God's righteous vengeance on the same. That's 1834. And I would submit to you that his words were prophetic and that the state of the spiritual and moral state of Britain and North America today far exceeds what he could have imagined. It matters what we believe about the history in the Bible because the history in the Bible is foundational to the theology and the morality the Bible is not just a, a collection of uh, pious statements, religious and moral pronouncements. It is about God's acts in time, space, history, and that history is foundational to the theology and the morality. Destroy the history in people's minds, and it'll, it won't be long before they reject the theology and the morality. I really unpack this idea in um, my last chapter in a book that I edited uh, uh, called Searching for Adam. And I show the connection between the rejection of Adam today that is widespread in the church and the compromise with millions of years. And so God has raised up creation ministries like Answers in Genesis and a number of other ministries in, in, in the UK and in America and Canada and South Africa and many other countries to help rebuild the foundations, to help the church know that we can believe this book right from the very first verse. And then we've developed resources to shoot down those ideas and expose them as philosophy, masquerading as science. And then we go out and do seminars. Uh, and when this uh, whole COVID-19 crisis ends and we can get back out into churches, we'll be going out into churches, teaching them so that they can then have the, the answers and the understanding to shoot down those ideas that come to the people in their church, the, the students, the youth. And then the church can say, come to Jesus, come to the cross and be saved. And there'll be integrity in the message because we'll be saying the gospel in this book is true because the history in this book is true right from the very first verse. 
So we're in a war, folks. Christians, you need to understand we're in a war, a war of ideas. And if you're not a Christian, you need to understand there's a war of ideas going on, truth against lies. And the God of this world, Satan, has blinded people and lied to the world and used men to lie and to speculate and imagine false histories and false ideas. You need to come to Christ. Well, there's a number of resources that I would recommend that you look at. The, the Four Answers books for teenagers and adults, which answer the 130 most asked questions. What about dinosaurs? What about carbon dating? Where did Cain get his wife? Where did the so-called races of people come from? Where, uh, was the flood global? Was the, the, were the days of creation uh, literal? Um, and how can you see distant starlight? in a young universe? These are the, the questions people are asking today. And you don't need a science degree to understand the answers. Each chapter is on a different question. This lecture is available if you want to watch it again or share it with somebody like in a, a, a living, uh, in a, a setting in your home. Uh, the Great Turning Point, if you want to dig into the history uh, more deeply. Six Days by Ken Ham explains in, in, in layman's terms uh, what's wrong with all these old earth ideas in the church, the day age view, the gap theory, the framework hypothesis, and then a more in-depth defense of the literal truth of Genesis is this book that I co-edited and contributed to with 13 other scholars. Uh, that's an in-depth book, be a great gift for your pastor if he doesn't believe Genesis. Searching for Adam, I mentioned six, uh, uh, 14 auth 16 authors defending the literal truth about Adam, biblically, theologically, historically, scientifically, genetically, uh, anatomically, uh, ethically, a full-blown defense of the truth of Genesis about Adam and our uh, the origin of the human race. The flood of evidence answers about uh, four, uh, 27 questions about Noah's flood and Noah's ark easy to read question and answer format. The Young Earth by John Morris, beautifully colored with, uh, uh, illustrated with color photos. It's got a great chapter on radiometric dating, great for teenagers and adults. If you want something more in depth, Andrew Snelling is our PhD geologist. He's done geological research on four continents. And this is a two volume, uh, uh, I think 1500 page work on the geological evidence for Noah's flood and a young earth. And so you can get that as a pack. The glass house answering <clears throat> or showing what's wrong with some of the most popular defenses of evolution in millions of years in the popular press and the textbooks. And we have answers books for grade school kids, uh, uh, five to 11 year olds. Each one answers about 20 questions with a one page answer. Great for parents and grandparents to discuss these things with the children. We have preschool books like N is for Noah. We have a book on dinosaurs, a number of books on dinosaurs and a DVD on dinosaurs. And my lecture on what's wrong with the older views in the church. Lectures by Andrew Snelling on the geological evidence. Lots and lots of resources to help you see the lie of millions of years. And this one has a short video. There are actually six short videos that are about three to five minutes long. One of those is on radiometric dating to help you understand that. Another one is on fossils in the flood. Another one is on the nature of science, net, uh, historical science versus experimental science. So those will really help you. And then uh, Dr. Snelling has an in-depth lecture for lay people and students on radiometric dating. We have a great family uh, friendly resource. The Answers Magazine comes six times a year. It's got a center section for the really little kids uh, teaching the Christian biblical worldview, not just about science, but all kinds of other issues uh, that we encounter. We have a free newsletter that comes uh, 12 times a year and you can sign up for that on our website and uh, thousands of articles on our website. We're putting more up all the time, tremendous resource. And there you can learn about our Creation Museum and the Ark Encounter, which are closed right now because of the COVID-19, but we're hoping we'll be opening in the next few weeks. And uh, so I encourage you to come over to see those in Northern Kentucky in the United States. 
on our website, we have a lot of live programs every day of the week at these uh, various times. You can find out about that on our website. And uh, we've just launched our Answers TV where all our videos will be available online in one place. And uh, you can try it out for a week free. And then it's very modest uh, annual price or monthly price uh, to have access to hundreds and hundreds of videos. And uh, by this summer sometime, we'll have those available with an app for your phone or, or tablet. Well, let me close with two quotes. Michael Denton, uh, Evolution of Theory and Crisis in 1985, he said, today it is perhaps a Darwinian view of nature more than any other that is responsible for the agnostic and skeptical outlook of the 20th century. I agree with that statement. But what's significant is Michael Denton then, is, and as far as I know today, uh, was and still is an agnostic. That's a very astute observation. I agree with him. But the problem did not start with Charles Darwin. The problem began. The revolution began when Ernst Mayer, who I quoted at the beginning, tells us when it began. Not when Darwin published his book, but when it became obvious that the Earth was very ancient rather than having been created only 6,000 years ago. This finding was the snowball that started the whole avalanche. The problem started with the rejection of the biblical chronology and the global flood. But it didn't become obvious by looking at rocks and fossils. It became obvious by men embracing an anti-biblical philosophical worldview called naturalism and uniformitarianism. So we need another reformation in the church. We need to return to the truth of Genesis 1 to 11. And I encourage you, if you're a Christian, to believe God's word. Psalm 40, verse 4 says, How blessed is the man who has made the Lord his trust and has not turned to the proud, nor to those who lapse into falsehood. Over the last 200 years, most of the church has followed those who lapse into falsehood instead of trusting the Lord. And he, Proverbs 29, 25 says, the fear of man brings a snare, but he who trusts in the Lord will be safe. We need a new fear of the Lord in the church. There are too many Christians who are fearing what scientists say instead of fearing what God says. And as we trust in him, we will be safe no matter what comes in the days ahead. Thank you for listening. And I pray that you will investigate those resources to learn more. God bless you. Thanks, Terry. Um, what, what an amazing talk for people um, to understand. You clearly showed the philosophical assumptions there by many. That's been smuggled in to how we understand the book of Genesis. And so um, if you've been watching tonight, just let me say, if you have any questions um, for Dr. Mortensen, then please do um, write those in the comment section quickly and we'll try and get to them. Also know that all of the resources Terry mentioned are available in our UK store. So if you just go to answersingenesis.org um, and go to the store, at the moment we're still doing a 20% offer, a discount offer on all the resources. So now is the time to get yourself equipped and even get those resources into the hands of your pastors and your friends in, in church. Terry, can I ask you a question? And you don't have to give names here, but you mentioned the fact that you've spoken to some of those leading apologists, theologians. How, how do conversations with those people normally go? Uh, usually they are very short. They don't really want to talk about it. Uh, I've offered them a free copy of my DVD, Millions of Years, The Grand Illusion. I've offered them in some cases, a, a copy of my book, The Great Turning Point, and they, they don't want it. They don't want to read it. Their, their minds are closed. They are so convinced that the scientific majority has proven millions of years that they're not going to look at it. And they often say to me, um, Terry, I don't have the scientific qualifications to evaluate the arguments. And so I'm not going to read what the creation scientists say. My response to that kind of answer is, 
well, then if you don't have the scientific training, you shouldn't believe anything that the secular scientists say either, because you don't have the ability to evaluate what they're saying. That is an erroneous objection. These, these people that I'm talking to have, have brilliant minds. They're trained PhD scholars. They have the intellectual skills to be able to look at, at arguments on both sides and evaluate the reasonableness. And they certainly all have a responsibility to look at the word of God that they profess is the inspired and errant word of the creator. So it, it breaks my heart. Um, I don't know what to do except to continue to speak and try to talk to them. We've yeah. also tried to get many of them on a, a special trip called uh, the Christian Leaders Trip through the Grand Canyon. The last 12 years, we've taken over 250 men from 24 countries, and we intentionally invite people who hold an old earth view or even a theistic evolution view to come and just listen to our geologists and Old Testament scholar. Uh, and, and many of them won't come even though it's a highly scholarship trip. So it's, it's really a battle of, uh, of truth. Yeah. Someone's asked the question, um, do you think there is much difference between theistic evolution and deism? Uh, no, not really. Um, theistic evolution basically says, well, kind of two different perspectives. One is that God created the, the infinitesimally small particle of mass energy space that that went bang and expo expanded and he built into that little bit of matter energy space the laws of nature and let it develop um, or a slightly different view that God was mysteriously guiding the process uh, over the millions of years but so hidden that no scientist can actually directly see any evidence of his uh, manipulating influence but Either way, in, in actual fact, it's 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 a deistic view. Yeah. So except, except that the theistic evolutionists, many of them, at least the ones who profess to be evangelicals, would say they believe in in miracles and they believe that Jesus died on the cross for their sins and was raised from the dead. So they're not total deists, they're like 95% deist. Yeah. Liberal liberal theologians would tend more to, to deism. Total deism. Yep. Yeah. Um, someone's asked the question that um, what do you think of Ravi Zacharias and, and Tim Keller about their views on Genesis? Well, um, Tim Keller says he's an old earther, but he has written a white paper, a lengthy paper for BioLogos, which is a theistic evolution group. And uh, it, it's clear, I've, I've watched him interviewed by Eric Metaxas, and it's clear he hasn't done his homework on this issue. Um, and Ravi Zacharias, I think, avoids the issue, um, but he his ministry very much links up with John Lennox, who accepts uh, the millions of years and believes in a view that is that there's a gap before the six days that start according to him in verse three of Genesis one. And then the days are literal, but there's a gap of an unknown amount of time between each of the days. So um, he, just hasn't, he just hasn't investigated the issue. And again, um, I've met John Lennox. I actually stayed in his home once while I was doing my PhD. He's a wonderful man. He's a brother in Christ. But, um, and Ravi Zacharias has done tremendous uh, things to help the church, but they don't understand this issue and they don't seem to be willing to really deal with the biblical text and with the creationist scientific arguments. Now, of course, we, we, met, we, we don't know people's motivations, but do you think the reason that is, is because of pride or do you think they just don't want the trouble that comes with believing in a young earth and in biblical creation? Well, I think I think there there's a couple of things, and you're right. We can't I can't I can't uh, evaluate anybody's motives, but the Bible talks about the fear of man. We're, we're all susceptible to that. I am, you are, everybody who's listening to us. We we care what other people think about us, and in the scientific community and in the theological community, 
uh, there is suffering if you take a young earth view. There's also the fact that you have 200 years of compromise with some of the greatest evangelical Bible-believing men saying the age of the earth doesn't matter. And that history, I've heard it from some of these modern men saying, are you saying that that Hodge and Warfield and, and these men were wrong? And I'm saying, yes, they were wrong on this. But the only person who never made a mistake was the Lord Jesus Christ. Everybody else makes mistakes. Uh, so uh, there, there's that factor. There's just the, the pressure of groupthink that, you know, it's the popular view to uh, defend intelligent design and that God created, but not defend the truth of Genesis. Yeah. So someone commented, truth is always a minority view in this fallen world, which is That's exactly right. The prophets were, were very lonely in the Old Testament. <laughs> the, the, the apostles uh, were all dead a few decades after Jesus. The church has always suffered persecution. And we've in, in Britain and America and in, in Western Europe, we've we've been living in a in really an unrealistic world because most of the church in the rest of the world and most of the church in the rest of history has suffered persecution of various forms from uh, scoffing and laughter and ridicule to loss of job loss of advancement uh, or or prison or death so we're we're going i believe we're going to see that in britain and and north america and western europe in the days ahead and and we're we're not going to be faithful to christ if we don't cling to his word yeah um what about um someone who may be in a church let's say with um a, a pastor who's unwilling to um listen to them on this issue, what advice would you give to that person if they can't move churches because of there may be nothing else around? Well, I would certainly pray for revival in your pastor. Pray that God will somehow get his attention and, uh, and certainly humbly try to keep giving him a, a short article or um, a book to read or a video to watch. And you have to you have to know where your pastor is at. Um, if he's if he tends to be a um, a deep reader and he wants he, you know he wants a book of substance, don't give him a short article. He'll just dismiss it. That's too shallow. Other pastors, they don't have time to read books. They want something short. So you need to assess where your pastor's at. But be praying for him. And I think with what's going on in the, in the world right now with this global pandemic uh, and the increasing persecution of Christians, that we need to pray for a revival in the church and that God's spirit will really get a hold of these pastors and bring them uh, to repentance over their unbelief and begin to preach uh, and, and do their homework. So, we got a lot of praying to do. Yeah, so, someone's asked, and he's, he's obviously got a bit of knowledge because he said, why um, would the European Leadership Forum not allow you to participate last year? I have no idea. <laughs> um, but, I mean, they said that there just wasn't enough room or, you know, that they want to have Europeans. I had filled out my application very uh, thoroughly explaining that I had lived in Europe for almost 20 years, in Eastern Europe, in Western Europe, in Britain. I have a great passion and burden for Europe. I've been back to, to speak on creation in uh, mainly in Eastern Europe, but some in, East, in Western Europe over the last uh, 20 years with Answers in Genesis. And um, so, you know, I put all of that in my application for uh, attending, but it didn't happen. So I, I'll just leave that in the sovereign hand of God. Yeah, um, and, we, and we do find sometimes even these topics seem just to be too controversial for, mm -hmm. for conferences, for forums, for people to handle, don't they? Because they think it's gonna, yeah. they'll be too divisive. But you know, there's so many divisive issues in, in the church and in the culture. And the non-Christian world 
you know, if we say, well, the, the non-Christian world's going to scoff at us, they're, they're, they're not going to listen to us. They scoff at us for believing in the virgin birth and the resurrection of Jesus and believing that Jesus died on the cross for our sins and that he's the only way to heaven. So, yeah. you know, we're not gaining anything by, by giving, a, giving ground away on certain issues. Yeah. Yeah, Paul told the Corinthians, we, we become fools for Christ's sake. Not that we become foolish, but that we become fools. Yeah. Um, we don't embrace the wisdom of the world, but rather we trust in the finished work of Christ and what he taught. Right. Terry, thank you for your time this night. I know many people in the comments section are really thankful for your lecture, have really appreciated it. And so appreciate your time tonight. And for everyone who's been watching, um, we do thank you for your time. And I pray that this will um, encourage you in your faith, but that you'll also take this information and share it with others, share it with people in your friends' circles, your, the people that you know in the church, your pastor, if he is not yet um, thought about this issue, please get this information to him. So good night and God bless. God bless.